Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first discussion panel of the evening, the historical and, and social benefits and significance of facial hair. I will announce the speakers. First, we have Dr. Christopher Oldstone Moore, PhD in history and gender, focusing on masculinity. Next, we have Dr. Paul Roof, PhD in sociology and pop, soci pop culture. And pop culture. Next, we have Mr. John Buckler of Lansing, Michigan. Runs. There you go. <laughs> He's an incredible and gentleman. So that's his credentials. <laughs> I'm a doctor of the heart. He's a doctor of the heart. Doctor BS, yes. <laughs> I have the questions on my phone. I'm not texting while we're doing this. <laughs> so, Dr. Christopher, we can start with you. Yep. How has facial hair been viewed historically? And how has it affected history? Okay, well, that's what I'm writing a book on, so this will take a long time. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I, I teach history at Wright State, and us professors, we love to do this, so it's time for a quiz. You guys ready? My wife got 100% on this. I don't know about you guys. She had access to the answers. All right, yeah. No. <laughs> no I have seven pictures, and I've chosen these seven to be the most significant faces to telling the history of beards. Okay. Who's this? Oh, this is tricky. This is the trick question. It's Sam. We have an answer from the audience? Answer? Anybody? I wish I was sitting next to your wife. I would know. Uh, <laughs> uh, good guess. This is Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut. She was pharaoh of Egypt in about 1500 BCE. Now, she took advantage of the fact that Egyptians shaved, and they were the first great shaved society. And so they, the pharaohs reserved the beard as a symbol of royal power. And it was always a fake beard that they wore. It was very styled and fake. And so, of course, as a female, as a female ruler, she had the beard too because all it took was a fake beard. So she, she has my vote for best fake beard. All right, number two. Oh. Hey, professor, there's no beard on that guy. That's right. This is the guy without the beard. This is the beard that wasn't. It's the most significant non-beard in history. Who is that guy? Close guess. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. Caesar copied Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great did not wear a beard. He was the first important man not to wear a beard in ancient history, and that established the shaving custom because he was such a successful man, conquered most of the world. Uh, he established a shaved look as the most respectable look, and that lasted for 400 years, including Caesar and Augustus until the first beard movement began with this guy. This guy, anyone know who this guy is? This is em <laughs> Emperor Hadrian in the second century. Emperor Hadrian. He was the first important man in the ancient world, ancient West, for 400 years to grow his beard. And he did so because he was a Stoic. He believed in Stoic philosophy. And the Stoics believed that men should wear beards because it was important to follow the laws of nature. And he wanted to rule according to the laws of nature. So that was the first beard movement. Now I am hoping somebody will recognize this guy. Now why did I put Jesus after Hadrian? Because Jesus lived before Hadrian. Ah, uh, but during Hadrian's time, Jesus didn't have a beard. But he grew one when he was many hundreds of years old. He grew one, this one, in the 500s AD. So for most of 400 years of Christian history, Jesus was beardless. And do you know why he was beardless? Because he had the classical mob. They were following the, the, the Alexander and Caesar and Constantine. All the important men were shaved. So Jesus was shown that way too. Until after the fall of Rome, they had a new style. And that new style was Jesus. And this is an icon. And icons are, he's in heaven. He's in heaven. And to show that he's also a man and not just some divine spirit. They gave him a nice, manly beard to show that he's a man. That's a very important beard, and we still have him. Uh-oh, this is hard. But my wife got this. This is Francois Le Premier, the Francois the First, King of France in 1520s. This is the second beard movement, the Renaissance. And again, like with Hadrian, we're going back to the beard because we're, we want, we're emphasizing the importance of nature and natural knowledge rather than spiritual knowledge of the Middle Ages. 
So the rulers of that era and artists and even the popes, even the churchmen, started to grow beards to show that they had that new knowledge of nature. Got two more. Uh, Abraham Lincoln. You know, uh, he is not a, he's not an initiator, but he's a follower. He's, he's the most iconic, most memorable beard of the third beard movement in the 19th century, when beards came back in the 19th century. And again, in the 19th century, men are trying to uh, reestablish the notion that men, this is the age of the common men. Men are men because they're men, not because they're rich or they own land or anything. So this is all part of the, the kind of democracy beard, I'll call it, right? And, and lawyers and politicians were the last to get on the bandwagon. So Abraham Lincoln was about 10 years late. A little girl wrote him a note and said, you look a lot better with a beard on. Everybody's wearing them. What about you? And Abraham Lincoln wrote back and said, yeah, I'm really an ugly guy. I could probably use a beard. And he wore the beard that was popular in the 1860s in America. Notice what it's missing. It's missing the mustache. That's what ministers as well as Amish wore because it was considered more peaceful, more uh, respectable because it didn't have that fiery mustache of the, which was associated with the military, because the military wore mustaches. So it's interesting that a commander in chief running a war didn't want to wear a mustache. He wanted to be more peaceful. Okay. Last one, 20th century. Clark Abel. Clark Abel. The modern caveman was one of the names that somebody gave him. And he had that pencil thin mustache, right? That savoir faire, that ooh, that ooh la la kind of extra edge that made, that split the women's vote. Some women loved it, some women didn't like it. It was too aggressive, it was considered aggressive. This was the individualist, this is the, the strong man, the, the tough guy, the rough guy. In, you know, in the movie, Gone with the Wind, he kind of rapes Scarlett, doesn't he? Uh, and uh, that's kind of, that's what he is. And, and um, Thomas Dewey, the you know, candidate for president in 44 and again in 48. Dewey beats Truman. Dewey, Dewey beats Truman, not! <laughs> He was called the Clark Gable of politicians because he had a very nice mustache. He was the only politician for years to have a mustache. And he's the last politician in American history to ever have any facial hair because he lost. And I think that his mustache had something to do with it. Women didn't like, didn't like their politicians to be too aggressive. So this was a little too much aggression for the 19, 1920s. So that's a rundown of a, the most important faces in the three beard movements. Now the question about whether we're going to have another one. We can deal with that later, but now you now you can pass the test. You'll be ready for the quiz tomorrow. Man, did you write those down, Kate? <laughs> well, you try it. Right. <laughs> that was a great response. Thank you very much. Uh, very Dr. Paul Roof, how is facial hair viewed today, and what are some of the challenges and benefits of having pronounced facial hair? I think uh, one of the things that I talk a lot about in my classes is the term master status. And master status is a status that you have that overrides other statuses. So people look at me and they immediately see my beard. They don't see that I'm married, that I have kids, that I own a house, you know, I pay taxes, um, I drive a truck, I have two dogs, I live in the suburbs, I have a PhD. That's not what they see, they see the beard. So I become on campus the professor with a beard. And I tell them I am not the professor with the beard, I am the beard with a professor. <laughs> and that just gets them to start thinking differently. Um, so master status is what it is for me and it is for many of us here. It becomes an identifier. People know you because of your beard, they, they see it as your calling card as well. I was down in Savannah, Georgia a couple weekends ago for a beard contest, and there was a guy there, early 20s, who had grown a, a big beard and was a Coca-Cola truck driver. And he said he was pushing the limits for Coca-Cola having that beard. And I said to him, I bet everybody on your route knows you. And everybody on his route knew him because of his big beard. And I said, I bet you get called Zach Brown all the time. So that's another example of master status. And I think that's a good thing in pop culture because no longer are people getting, say, ZZ Top comments. You're getting Zach Brown comments. So somebody like Zach Brown in mainstream country music is pushing the envelope as well, and he helps the rest of us by being out there with a full pronounced beard. But more specifically to the question, I think facial hair and the, the idea of facial hair has definitely changed, especially for 
for the culture in the last eight years. Uh, as the world championships have become popular, as local and regional championships have become popular, uh, it, is, it is out there in terms of a beard con, right? Here we are because of our beards and mustaches. It is out there on a reality TV show. Um, and I would argue the people on that reality TV show are much realer than Snooki. They're, they're much realer than the Pawn Wars or whatever is taking place. Um, so I think we also look for authenticity as well. And Michelle Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer would always say, you know, when I go to a party, I hang around the smokers because the smokers are the most interesting people at a party. Well, I think today, if I go to a party, I hang around the beards and the mustaches because the beards and the mustaches are the most interesting people at any party. And it's a topic of conversation. Um, but challenges, eating is a challenge. <laughs> And beauty has a price. So I live with that challenge. I learned to wipe away. I learned to carry a hanky. And I'm okay with it. it. It slows down my life a little bit. And I'm okay with my life being at a slower pace. Um, sometimes I wish when I style my beard that I could pop it on the nightstand and put it like that the next morning. <laughs> if that invention ever comes out, I think that would be really cool. But beards and mustaches are not about being lazy. In actuality, when you have a beard and you take care of it, it takes more time, more primping, more styling in front of the mirror, etc. Um, they ask the question, why do I have a beard? When anybody asks me that question, I turn it around and say, why don't most men have beards? You know, I, I think it should be the norm. And I like being environments that are part of my subculture, and it is the norm. And, you know, the beard has transformed my life. Eight years ago, I shaved every summer, and I kept like a three-guard beard and would go do a goatee in the summer, but I always felt emasculated when I shaved, and I always felt like I looked like somebody who I was not. That was not the person in the mirror. And I tell this traumatic story about dating a girl in college, and I come home probably my sophomore year with an exam beard. You know, it was I don't even have a picture of it, right? Probably like a week, week's worth of growth, and she would not go to the mall with me until I shaved. So being a 20-year-old, I go back home and I shave and I emasculated myself and I hurt my self-esteem. I meet my wife six years later and I come back from Australia. I've been backpacking and I've got like a three-month beard. She goes, I love your beard. Don't ever shave. There you go. So I went home and shaved <laughs> just to see if she was for real. She said, I look mean without my beard and I grew my beard from then on out. I had to have a beard at the wedding. And, you know, she's been with me for 15, 16 years. She's a keeper. She's a keeper. And my, the beard has transformed my life. I looked in the mirror eight years ago and said, this is the last time I'm going to do that. And it's the last time I did. And only good things have happened. You go to Bend, Oregon. I go on a rafting trip. I'm in the paper. Right. I go and go to Norway. We're literally in Norway in this small town for 30 minutes. And we end up in the paper the next day. And I come to Columbus, Ohio, and I'm sitting on a panel. So it is like a magic carpet ride, and I'm just enjoying the ride, and I'm never going to do it again, never going to shave, and people become, especially in a disposable society, people are uncomfortable with the word never. You know, I'm never going to cheat on my wife. What? Well, I took a vow that I would never do that. I'm never going to shave. What? You can't say never. I just did. Very good. <laughs> Next question is for Mr. John Buckler. As one of the leaders of one of the Midwest's largest and most active facial hair clubs, how would you say that facial hair clubs are impacting our society today? Uh, so my thought on this is people that can grow facial hair now, people that are of an age that they grow bigger facial hair, you're bridging the gap right now. The youngest crowd are the, the last group of kids, I guess, that grew up in era without the internet. And so you have this interesting juxtaposition of people that you know, grew up where I did, it was kids running around the neighborhood and just getting together, playing kick the can, and everyone on the block played together all the time. And then you have this, the younger generation that don't interact in public a lot. So you have the, the internet people, but you have this last bridge, and what we're doing is it's a grassroots effort to kind of use today's technology and our beards to join together as a large group again, to A, promote our own towns, we're all growing up and we, we were fighting back. You know, there's a lot of decimation. The recession's going on. You know, I grew up Detroit and Lansing, big car plants. And as soon as all those car companies were shuttering their doors, people just split. And there wasn't a sense of community anymore. And so what we're doing is we 
we've joined this community of facial hair lovers, <coughs> and we have this background of having a tight community when we were playing uh, playing in the street with the kids. And we're trying to bring that around. So I come here, it's a, it's a family, is what the facial hair community is. It's a family. And we're taking that feeling and we're bringing it back to our hometowns and trying to spread that in our own hometown, saying, hey, come to Lansing, come to Columbus, come to Charleston. Yeah, it's tough, but we're here, we love it, we're fighting for it. And so we need to stick together, we need to form these groups. And if it's just a group that's quasi, I mean, it's, it's got a facial hair theme, like my beard club, Gaffo, but it's more than that. We're just a group of friends that are in different professions. We have mechanics and nurses and IT guys and teachers and lawyers and stuff like that. You're touching all these different communities, and you're just bringing them all together to form one tight-knit group that believes in a cause. And we're trying to just bring back that feeling of community that was lost for so long. It's wonderful. wonderful. That the next question, I'm going to stick with you. What are one or two of the specific things that your club has done to benefit your region, your area? Well, I mean, obviously the easy one is we threw beard and mustache competitions. We've thrown three of them sure. and, you know, for various local charities, just money through the door, alcohol sales, all that stuff goes to the charity. We volunteer at all local events, you know, the Oktoberfest and Blues Fest. We just, you know, we'll go, we'll help set up, we'll help pour drinks, just anything like that. You know. One of the things John touched on is like community and we form a community and then we become leaders within the community. Instead of being, oh, this guy with a beard downtown walking around, it becomes, oh, that's a guy who's a member of the Holy City Beard and Mustache Society. So it gives you, like, status and prestige. And, oh, that's the group that raises money each year. For the last three years, we've worked with a group called Low Country Women with Wings. And they raise money for ovarian cancer research. September is ovarian cancer month. Everybody knows October is breast cancer awareness month. So it's not pink, it's teal. The ribbon is teal. So our money goes towards that charity, and we bring a cancer survivor up on the stage, we present them with a check, the women wear teal mustaches, um, all of their paraphernalia and information is at the contest. So we, we do good things for the community, and I think because it's cross-gender, it's good to see bearded guys doing something for the ladies. Right? Once you do those things, you establish relationships where the, the charity starts saying, when's next year's event? So the first year we raised $3,000, they like they thought $300 was going to come in, you know? And then we started handing them cash, $3,000, like, what? They were like, sign us up. You guys are doing good work. Because it's hard, especially in an economic recession. Charities, volunteer organizations take a hit. And here we are, guys with beards and mustaches in the community, being positive social change on the front lines of it, I think. So you become leaders and community gets involved. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Oldstone Moore, do you have any insights into the current impact of facial hair? Oh, well, that's a broad question, but I just have one thing to say, and I think one of the things you look at at the 20th century, during the 20th century, is that um, facial hair is very rare, has been throughout the 20th century. It's, it's, it's making something of a comeback in recent years. I think you mentioned that. Generally, socially speaking, it stands, it, it's a representation of men who uh, are trying to express individuality and independence to some extent. And, and in some sense, resisting the corporatization and the collectivization and the uh, uh, conventionalization of life. And uh, in that sense, it's, help, it's, it's a healthy thing. Um, and if, insofar as society can tolerate it, it shows a higher degree of tolerance in society generally. So it's a, it's a good thing that there's a higher degree of tolerance. But you'll, you'll see that it's, like for example, Disney apparently now permits for the first time modest facial hair on its workers at its amusement parks. That was a very strict rule for a long, long time. And, uh, and that's showing corporate world is being, starting to flex and allow a little bit more, a less rigidity in its corporate life uh, and uh, for a little bit more flexibility for its workers. That's a good sign, uh, and I think that's the most significant aspect of facial hair. Can I ask a follow-up question to what he just said? Absolutely. Um, do you think that, that the I guess, the relaxation of rules of corporate, you know, America, do you think that is a byproduct of, okay, so a lot of people who are coming into, um, I guess, positions of prestige are either... They're raised by people, uh, parents who are from like the hippie generation or the '60s oh. movement. Like, so they grew up in maybe a little bit more relaxed household. It's okay to have a beard and stuff like that. And so now, those kids that were born in the '60s are getting to that point of 
they're in charge, and so they see it as less of a threat? Maybe, maybe. I, I haven't thought of it. It could be that. I, I think it's more general. Uh, I see it as part of a larger acceptance of individual difference okay. along, along a large scale, not just associated with hair, but right. we, we're a more uh, poly, uh, we're a more uh, pluralistic society. Skin color, yeah. body type, gender, uh, it's all part of that, it seems to me. Although I think the, the 60s experience probably was helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, a little briefly here, because we're a little over time. What do each of you see in the future for facial hair? Start with Dr. What's going on? Briefly, I, I think it's going to gradually become more common, but I don't think we're ready yet for a beard movement, like I described. Where a beard movement is where it becomes the majority, or even the vast majority, uh, style. I don't see that happening, which means that beer clubs are safe. Uh, <laughs> if, if that happens, you guys are in trouble. Uh, but I, I think you guys are good to go. However, I do see a larger and larger uh, subculture. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, a wider and wider acceptance of variation within a largely shaved culture. <laughs> Still. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Roof. I was just talking to a, a buddy of mine who had a big Donegal beard and visible tattoos on his arms. And his company made him shave, right, and made him trim down his big beard. But they were okay with the tattoos. Um, when when you think about that, tattoos were underground for the longest time. And now we've become to accept tattoos. And I think that there'll be this ebb and flow with beards um, and for it to be a movement and to be the majority. Instead of Al Gore, for example, losing the election and growing a, a, a loser beard, right? He goes off into the wilderness because he's lost and he doesn't have to shave anymore. But the, he found the beard, he found himself. He did, <laughs> but then he shaved it. Well, yeah, you know? but he found himself. But if, we, <laughs> if we could have an anchorman and a president and senators with beards and we didn't talk about it, it was just accepted, then that, that would be a seismic shift, I think. Instead of, oh, that's the senator with a beard. Or imagine if Obama or Romney grew beards, right? I mean, it would be the talk of the town because we are superficial. Because the mainstream media focuses on the superficial. I mean, instead of talking about their platforms and their ideas, we're going to talk about what they look like. And so, I mean, until we can get beyond the snapshots and the 30 second sound bites, you know, you're going to have to have beard clubs. Um, and I, but I think about like maybe we did have a golden age. You go back to Abraham's Link, Abraham Lincoln's time period, and after that, CEOs and titans of industry had beards. When you when you look at these Civil War soldiers and generals, they were the leaders, and it disappeared. But there was a moment where they were the titans, and I hope it comes back. Mr. Buckler, uh, I think facial hair. The facial hair community is. Well, it's going to grow, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's there's going to be more people accepting a beard, and there's going to be more people growing, but then it, I think it's going to evolve into something else, and people aren't going to travel for beard mustache competitions forever. Who knows how long this run is going to last, and then what's going to happen is you're going to see the facial hair clubs and people beards that are fighting for their community and doing charity work. They're just going to be a tight-knit group. They're going to become the next Elks Lodge or Moose Lodge or, you know, people that just get together and try to do right by the world. And that's where it's going to go, I think, in the future. And people are just going to have facial hair in the long run, and nobody's ever going to talk about it. Who knows when that's going to happen, but that is where it's going to go. 40 years minimum. Yeah. <laughs> you said 40 years minimum. <laughs> we, need, we need to have someone get elected and then grow a beard is what we do need to have. Start the draft. Last president with facial hair? Who was that? Roosevelt. No, no Harding. No, I know Paris. this. Tap. Tap. That was Howard. 100 years ago. We're good. So we, right. we're talking about big spans of time. But yeah, was the, was Taft from? Oh, yeah, right here in Columbus. Yeah, right, right here. President Taft, last president with facial hair, Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> there you go. We've come full circle. We have come full circle, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Gentlemen, Mr. John D. Buckler of Lansing, Michigan. Great American Fierce Beard Organization. Dr. Paul Roof Woo! from Charleston, South Carolina. Dr. Christopher Oldstone Moore. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Appreciate you. Thank you very much.